you. Good morning, all. I see that Jersey is in the house today. And for my contacts, I'm going to take you a little south of Elizabeth down to Trenton, New Jersey. Before I start talking about Trenton, New Jersey, um, I need to tell you that I am from the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I am very much an island girl. I may not sound like it, but it's true. And I am also very country, as in got a cow for my 10th birthday country, <laughs> OK? <laughs> Some children want pets, dogs. I wanted a cow. All my friends had one. So <laughs> true story. So imagine the context shock when I first start to do ministry in a city context. The city where I worked is Trenton, New Jersey. It's a small city, eight square miles, with a population of 85,000 people. Um, Trenton School District has about a 50% graduation rate. Of those who graduate, 28.9% uh, show proficiency in math. About 66% show literacy proficiency. So you can imagine um, that this lends itself to a place ridden with crime, hopelessness, and lots of work for us to do. But Trenton has not always been that way. If you drive into the city, one of the bridges say, Trenton makes and the world takes. Back in its heyday, it was an industrial boom. Right? Now there are abandoned factories all over those places, but those factories used to make things. And they also made a proud, booming economy for a great city. It was a working man city. And like many other cities and towns across the USA, when factories leave, there is this question of, so what do we do now? What happens now? Who are we now? What do we look like now? And you can't go very long in Trenton without hearing a radio ad, an invitation to a meeting, something or another that invites you to some sort of revitalized Trenton event, revitalized Trenton meeting. And what everybody at these meetings wants you to do is talk about how can we go back to the glory days? Right? How can we go back? How can we be what we used to be? And I needed to understand this context because it took me a while to really understand my youth. Right? It took me a while to really get what they were saying and where they were coming from. When we would talk about their goals in life, and we would talk about what they wanted to do in their future, these bright, beautiful children that I loved had such this sense of hopelessness about the future. And it took me a while to realize, well, what else do you expect from a community <laughs> that always talking about how can we go back? They're not really thinking about how we can go forward. They are asking the wrong question. Now, I know that, again, Trenton's not the only place where this happened. We are riddled um, with the drug called nostalgia, because everything was better back then, right? Everything was greater back then, and how can we go back? Again, I say that's the wrong question. And what, the, what this led for my youth is really a lack of understanding of how do we go forward? How can we imagine something different? And as I struggled with this, I looked at one of my favorite quotes um, from one of my favorite authors, Zora Neale Hurston, who opens her text, Their Eyes Are Watching God, with the quotation, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with a tide. For others, they sail forward on the same horizon, never out of sight, never landing until the watcher turns his eye away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. She says this is the way of men. Hurston goes on actually to talk about that for women it's different. Now women forget all those things they don't want to remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth. 
then they act and do things accordingly. And I look at the opening of this text, and I think, that's pretty heavy. That your dreams, your future, your goals are out there, and you can't quite get it. It may come in, come in with the tide, but you can't quite reach it. Because ships at a distance have every person's dream on board. And what I found interesting is that while I can get that for the population that Zora talks about and the population that she works with, when you've been through some things and you've been knocked down several times, you can kind of resign yourself to, you know, the dream is the truth. You can resign yourself to that. But then I think, shouldn't children be different, right? These are these bright-eyed, imagination-full, optimistic, the world is your oyster kind of children. These are not the children I had. I brought these to the kids and I thought, you know what is interesting to me about this? Is that you have both genders that see this in this way. Neither of them jumps in the ocean and swims and go gets their dreams. One kid responds, we all, we every, every, every youth group has one of these. Well, I can't swim. <laughs> he gets a laugh and I get an idea. <laughs> Are we actually giving our kids the tools they need to walk into the future? The theological tools that they need, right? Not so much the life skills that they need, they need those too. But the theological tools that they need to walk into the future with God and imagining something different, something that looks different from what they know. Because at some point, you may have to say, OK, I don't really know what, is, what my future looks like. I don't really know what I need to do. But I know one thing. This right here ain't it. And that's when negation turns into affirmation. Right? Kwak Pulat, a theologian that I work with, and I'll talk more about her in depth in a little bit, talks about imagination as a means to discern that something is not fitting. So we search for new images and arrive at new patterns of meaning and interpretation. So what makes this type of imagination theological? By asking the question, who is it that God wants us to be? And then where is our agency? as we live in to this idea of who God wants us to be. I'm gonna skip that. So theological imagination um, is where a community of believers seeks God to discover new ways of being. And it is very important that this happens in community with our youth, and it looks multi-generational. Right? Where we share together, we discern together, what is it that God wants us to be? So, this is Kwak Krulan. And she wrote the text, Postcolonial Imagination and Feminist Theology. And the context that she speaks about is a postcolonial context. And for her, she's looking at a population of people who have been owned by other people. Right? So they had their identity. These other people came along and put their identity upon right, the, the native people's identity. And now these people, the second people, have left. And they need to figure out, what is our identity now? And there is a group saying, well, what we need to do is go back. Right? We need to go back to who we are before those folk came here and started messing with us. Right? And she raises a very important point. Many people have been colonized for hundreds of years, right? No one here remembers who we were before those folks started messing with us. And their culture is our culture, right? We've been combined. So we can't really go back. We need to go forward. And we're not, you know, what we were way back before they started messing with us. We we're not what we were before independence. We have to be something different. So she says, let's look at the theological imagination. 
and she looks at it in three ways. First, the historical imagination. Now, I know I often harp on people who want to go back. I'm not anti-history. I'm anti-nostalgia. So the historical imagination, Kwok notes the importance of telling stories that have been silenced by the colonizers as they stripped away the historical narrative. The historical imagination aims not to reconstitute the past, but also to release the past so that the present is livable. Exploring the past not only gives an understanding of how things can be, but also gives hope. So exploring the past with theological imagination helps teens know, the sim know that similar lives have been lived before God before, and that God has responded to situations in a variety of ways. See, in the different ways God has responded to similar situations in the past, helps teens to think about how God can work through them to rework their future. Kwok notes that the future is not a grand finale, a classless society or even a kingdom of God at this moment, but more immediate, concrete, and touchable. This distinguishes the task of imagination from fantasy or wishful thinking. Theological imagination will allow teens to think of concrete ways God can alter their present and their future. The second aspect is dialogical imagination, defined as attempts to bridge the gaps of time and space, to create new horizon, and to connect the desperate elements of our lives into a meaningful whole. So with youth, this type of imagination can be seen as blending the sacred and the secular and opening space for cross-generational ge cross involvement in fostering theological imagination. Cross-generational involvement is key. I could do a whole other 15, 20, hour and a half on cross-generational involvement. Um, history is not only something that one studies, but it's something that has been lived. So mixing the experience of the older generation and that joyful naivete and wild, the, the world is my oyster, idea of the youth can produce profound ideas of how to live in the future. And the third type of imagination is diasporic imagination. Diasporic imagination, coming from the word diaspora, rec recognizes the diversity of diasporas and honors the different histories and memories. It is applicable to youth here because while you know, youth within our context may all live in similar places, they cannot be painted with the same cultural brush. Teens from different contexts need to work together as they discover a new vision for their lives. So to fight the feeling of isolation, they, need, they feel they ought to be connected and know that other, th other teens are working with similar problems in their context. So the more we have a community involvement, the more we have joint ideas, the more we have God expressing God's self through different people, the more we have a rich, vivid, collective imagination. And going back to my friend Zora Neale Hurston, the first quote I gave is how she started her book. This is how she ends it. This is about the protagonist, Janie. If you haven't read it, you should go read it. It's a really good book. Janie, she pulled in her horizon like a great fishnet, pulled it from around the waist of the world, and draped it over her shoulder. So much of life in its meshes. She called in her soul to come see. I love that because it's even taken it further than my third way of swimming in and going and get your <laughs> dreams on the boat, right? She's like, I don't even have time for that. I'm going to bring the boat to me. So she reaches around and she grabs that bad boy. 
and all of it and all of the dreams and brings it to her. And this can so remind us that the dreams that God has for us is so much bigger than the dreams that we can have for ourselves. Because I was fine with swimming. And I've been taught that when our eyes are watching God, we can pull it around us because the creator of the universe who created that horizon is on our side. Thank you.